Hi, I'm an Australian living here in Belarus and I am in Minsk, the country's capital at the moment, and I'm literally standing right in front of the building where Lee Harvey Oswald lived for more than two years. I'm going to walk down and show you his exact apartment and I'm going to give you some background as to what happened and what his life was like here in Minsk. If you want to come and see this site for yourself, you want to come to Victory Square Metro, stop 117. This is the monument itself here and this building here is a very famous building that you will see in some rare archive footage of the region during that time. At the bottom is Berserker, a famous Italian restaurant. So I'm going to walk south towards the park here and I'm going to talk you through a little bit about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's life. First of all, the events of the day, of course, he uh, shot the then president, JFK, and the exact circumstances around this is the controversial part. I'll cut back to this in detail. Uh, this was on live television. You've no doubt seen the footage. You can see the, the blood coming from the head. He slouches in the car there. And then two days later, uh, live television again, he's giving an interview, Lee Harvey Oswald giving an interview, and some guy just comes up to him right close range, boom, shoots him. Pretty intense stuff. Um, so before all this happened, he was a defector. He went off to the USSR in the most bizarre of circumstances, and they shipped him down here to Minsk for more than two years, actually, before he reverse defected, or maybe reverse defected, back to the USA. So let me tell you about his life. So he was born to a woman who had already two children, and his father died before he was born. And straight away you're like, oh man, I know my data, and I know the data of fatherless children is usually not very good, right? So anyway, he was born, um, the two older children, the mother put them into an orphanage and just kept Lee there on his own until he was three and then put him in the orphanage as well where he stayed until he was 12. So you can see those formative years there, not a lot of love, probably not very well adjusted. And indeed, within a couple of years, when he was around 14, 15, he got into the communist literature, that socialist literature, and started believing in these kind of Marxist ideas and the structure of communism and so on. At 17, he joined the Marines. He had problems in the Marines. He then uh, left. He was preaching Marxist stuff left, right and center, apparently, to all the other people in the, arm and in the Marines. For some reason, he was never investigated <laughs> in the middle of the Cold War, and he wasn't investigated for preaching all this Marxist stuff to everybody. His nickname in the Marines was like a something-something-chenko, you know, like pretending he's Russian, like a joke on, on him. It's kind of weird that he was never actually uh, investigated. Anyway. He left, he showed up in Moscow, and he said, hey, I want to defect. And the Russians are like, what is this? <laughs> Who is this idiot, right? So they're trying to work out what's going on. Because why would an American defect to Russia, right? It wasn't exactly happening very often. So they're trying to figure out, well, who is this guy? He initially applied for some kind of political asylum and was rejected pretty much instantly. However, the, he was very persistent. Um, he made a suicide attempt and he ended up in hospital in Moscow and there was actually one parliamentarian, one Communist Party member, should I say, who really thought this is a good idea, let's keep this guy around. And they did a whole lot of interviews on him and they realised pretty quickly, this guy's nobody, yeah? He's not a spy, he's just an average dude. Because spies are very particular kinds of people. Spies are high IQ, I mean frontline spies, right? Frontline spies. They have to be socially savvy, they have to be socially aware, they have to be socially able, high IQ, very high IQ. There's only a small proportion of the population who can be an effective spy, right? And it's pretty obvious to them, pretty quickly, this was not a spy. But anyway, they're still kind of curious. So like, all right, well, let's keep him then. He can stay here, put him to work. He's a young man, able-bodied. Let's uh, put him into the factories, right? But they wanted to get him out of Moscow, because just in case something was going on, right? So they sent him down to here in Minsk. And they set him up in this building. Very top there. This is only a four level building, by the way. Inner city Minsk is full of four level buildings. These are very elite, wealthy areas. And of course, he was overlooking, look at this, river and a whole lot of park area there. And on this side, a whole lot of park area as well. So uh, where it was propped up was really, really prime real estate. This is like creme de la creme stuff. Uh, I have a buddy who actually lives in this block and his apartment's nice. <laughs> so this is a, a serious area. So I don't know why, but they put him here. They gave him just some random 19 year old American guy who they then put to work in electronics factory, making TVs and making radios. They put him here for some reason. 
Now he was only here for around one year when he realized, you know what? Living in communism is really shitty. I want to go home. <laughs> Can you imagine? What an idiot. He's got obsessed with this stupid ideology that makes no sense. And then he comes here and then he realizes it's all a scam and he wants to go home again like a little brat. It's so funny. But anyway, this is what happened. But they didn't let him go easily. They held it up for a year or a year and a half. So he stayed here against his will for some time and then let him go in uh, 1962. Now in between then, he got himself a nice little Belarusian wife. He met her within a month, he married her, which is actually not out of line with a lot of Slavic stereotypes from this uh, part of the world, to be fair. She was pregnant, I think a month later or two months later, and out came uh, their first child. Within about one year of him getting back to America, he then uh, killed JFK, shot him, and he himself again was killed live on television uh, two days later. I want to discuss two more things. One is the research I've done on this. I've watched a few documentaries and blah, blah, blah. And look, there's a lot of contradictory information out there. It's very interesting to see that even now in the modern era, we see that it's constant propaganda being thrown at us. There's no actual truth. It's just someone's version to get us to believe something so that we're more malleable for something else. You know, that seems to be the essence of it. And it seemed to be the same thing then. So what seems to have happened, and again, this might not be true, but what seems to have happened is that he was part of a larger network and he was the end assassin of that larger network. And indeed, he was arrested within two hours of the shooting. And the FBI's original report said this is what I'm led to believe. Uh, this is a, a communist thing. Um, there's multi uh, communist parties involved, the American, Cuban and maybe one or two others were involved in this and this was a, a very deliberate assassination and he again was just the actor of this deeper uh, structured plan but then the politicians came in and said hey if we make this public this is gonna give the American public two things one a thirst for blood right they're gonna be like well if these guys we're America we're gonna get them back right and of course what happens then is this escalation and you got two very powerful countries with very powerful weapons with the potential to just wipe each other out. Um, so that was one theory. The other theory is just sheer propaganda. Propaganda, you have to make your country and your people buy into your civilization. Right? They've got to believe it. They've got to believe the Rockies and the Rambos are true heroes. They've got to believe in this black-white narrative. You know, Otherwise, when there starts to be shades of grey, people start to think and all of a sudden the empire doesn't seem so great. So I think they really didn't want to give a propaganda victory to communism, because that's a hell of a thing. They just shot the president, right? I mean, that would embolden the American communists, uh, all the surrounding area communists, Latin America was infected with this stuff at the time, half of Europe as well, and much of Asia. So I think a lot of it was, not, was trying to not give them a propaganda um, push, a propaganda boost. So they wanted to try to pretend that it was just some lone wolf crazy guy who did this and not part of something bigger. Now this could be entirely wrong. Maybe he was lone wolf crazy guy, but they did do a, a government study into it. And as soon as you hear the word government study, it's like, well, what does that even mean? I mean, you know, the same people who make the decisions, write the reports, whatever. But the initial report said, oh no, he was a lone wolf guy. But then when it was redone 20 years later, it's like, it's very clear that he wasn't. It's very clear he was part of a larger cell. Uh, of people. The other thing I want to mention is to do with communism itself and this kind of Marxist ideology and this Marxist thought patterns and the way of kind of viewing the world in this Marxist way. Um, I'll look specifically at communism. So this seems to be so appealing because inside all of us humans, we have this fairness mechanism inside of us. We want to have a sense of fairness, that we're being treated fairly, things are fair. This is a fairly normal thing. I think it's an innate thing actually. So you can see that the ideas of Marxism can really appeal to the average person. However, when you're a grown up and you have to think things through, clearly it's a really dumb idea. And this is why, well there's several reasons why. This is one very clear reason. In order to make everyone quote unquote equal, what do you have to do? Well you have to centralize power to such an extent where you have a handful of people controlling all of industry all the decisions of industry, all the decisions of consumption, all of the courts, all the laws, all the police, all the military, all the media, you are giving absolute unilateral control 
incredible centralized unilateral control and then expecting them to do the right thing and redistribute a productive economy to the population and not just keep it for themselves. Now that I've said it, it seems so friggin' stupid, doesn't it? As if they won't. And yeah, you can try and put in some checks and balances. Yeah, bullshit, right? We've seen how it's worked time and time and time again. And again, as a, as a theory, when you dig a bit deeper, I mean, I get the fairness thing, right? I get the fairness thing, that, that's, that's in play. But how to do this, you, you can't do it. You can't make everyone the same, everyone equal. Because what's required to do that can be so and will be so tyrannical. And we've seen it in every single instance this has been tried. I lied, I've got one more thing. <laughs> now I'm thinking about this a bit more and it's like, oh, you know what? So this was an ideological battle, right? It was an ideological battle on some level. You know, whether or not what we're being sold is actually what we're fighting for, who knows? But what you had was this guy who was defecting from the free market individualism, etc. Um, defecting to a more homogenous, centralized, fair kind of economy, right? And he was rejecting one ideology for the other. And he came to, to Russia in the middle of the Cold War. You know, it's pretty full on stuff. Now, I'm here in Belarus, kind of chilling out. You know, I came here because of COVID freedoms and look, it's comfortable. It's a classic European city for most uh, intents and purposes. So I've just kind of stayed here until things really clear up around the world and I can kind of head off somewhere else. But, you know, I'm happy enough here. But uh, a lot of guys come here for very political reasons. And I've seen a lot of American guys here. And they're all cut from a very similar cloth. And they're all here for very political reasons. It's really interesting. So this modern day Marxism, which has been reincarnated with several different styles, but is very strong and uh, thriving in America and being pushed out around the world. They're here because of that. So we've actually got some kind of Lee Harvey Oswald thing happening now. Instead of just one dude going, you've got a whole heap of American dudes here who are concerned about culture change and culture differences. I'm like, that's interesting. It's kind of happening again. Because as I say, all the American guys I meet here have a very, very similar and very definite kind of moral structure and idea about the world. So I'm kind of interested to see this as this whole, um, that the culture war thing in America, as that's pushed out around the world and it's being pushed here in Belarus, of course. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out uh, in the future and, and to see what happens but anyway that's me from Minsk here's where the old boy lived the Harvey Oswald I hope you enjoyed this video I've got lots more videos like this from life here in Belarus talking about the culture talking about dating and women because men seem to like this topic and I've also now built a consultancy service if you want to come move here to Belarus if you want to come here to find a wife you can check out my website marriedinminsk.com